cells that are really nice and healthy and they are able to move really quickly. And these sperm cells essentially are able to take these specialized highways inside the female's uterus and reach those oviducts very, very quickly. So we know that as a fact as well. So once you do deposit the semen either by AI or if you do a natural service, the semen uh, or the sperm cells divide equally between the two sides of the tract. The female reproductive tract has two horns or uterine horns, each leading to the ovary. So these sperm cells essentially divide themselves. They swim up each tract and then they reach the oviducts on both sides. Again, this is very important, especially if you're dealing with low volume doses or if you're dealing with frozen semen, and I'll touch base on that more as we discuss. And then again, you always heard the adage about, oh, it just takes one to do the job. No, it does not take one to do the job. It literally takes millions of these cells to do the job of fertilization. So again, we'll touch base on that uh, a bit more in the following slides. So once these sperm cells travel the uterus, they reach the oviducts, uh, and the distal most portion of the oviduct just uh, attached to the uterus is called as the isthmus, and they form a reservoir over there. When I was at the university, I used to teach students uh, to imagine a big parking lot outside Walmart where you have all these cars parked. So you have these sperm cells essentially forming a reservoir inside this parking lot in the oviduct. And these cells undergo certain changes. These cells, once they reach the oviduct, are not able to fertilize the egg immediately. They have to attach to the wall of the oviduct. They undergo certain molecular changes, one of them being capacitation. And it takes them about three or four hours sometimes to be ready to fertilize that egg. Now, if you're using processed semen, chilled semen or frozen semen, these un cells undergo the same process in a lesser amount of time. So all of these points are an important consideration on how or when are you supposed to breed the mare in that cycle. Now, I told you it takes more than one. So you take literally takes millions of these sperm cells to achieve the ultimate goal, which is fertilization. The reason I say millions is because the egg or the, uh, the oocyte has a thick wall around it called as the zona. And these millions of these cells literally act like battering rams, and they keep on weakening the cell wall to a point where this one lucky guy manages to do its job and enters the cell. And then there's the, when fertilization starts occurring or the embryo starts forming. All mares, regardless of age, regardless of parity, regardless of which type of semen you're using, react to semen. So semen, again, it's a foreign substance. It's got proteins inside it. Sperm cells have proteins on its surface. So all of these cells incite a reaction within the mare. And this reaction can be minor where the mare just gets a lot of these white blood cells to clean things out. Or it could be a severe reaction where the mare develops a lot of fluid inside the uterus. Again, we'll talk more about it in the following slides. But all of these factors, essentially, we need to know all of these factors because it tells us when to breed the mare efficiently. It tells us how to use our semen samples, especially limited samples efficiently to get, get good pregnancy rates. So some of the basic rules for good pregnancy rates in mares are, again, you've got to breed the mare at the appropriate time depending on what type of semen you're using. With fresh semen, you have a bigger window because the semen lasts inside the mare for a longer time. With frozen semen, sperm cells last inside only for eight to 12 hours. So the window of fertilization or breeding is very small. You need to breed with the appropriate dose for good conception and pregnancy rate. So appropriate dose, meaning you need to have enough number of cells. Like I said, it takes millions to break down the egg wall. So you need to have these appropriate number of cells inside your insemination dose and not just regular sperm cells. They have to be live, good quality sperm cells. So quality plus quantity makes that big difference between a mare becoming pregnant or being open. Like I said, you can try and identify these problem mares and try and clean them out as early as four hours after insemination. Most mares have that semen deposited and forming a reservoir within four hours after insemination. You can start cleaning that mare out by 
lavaging her uterus or giving her oxytocin or doing some form of treatment, especially if this mare is prone to building a fluid as early as four hours after insemination. Again, I cannot stress this enough, good collection techniques, hygiene uh, on part of the stallion as well as mare management plays a big, big important role in preventing infertility. If you do not clean the stallion well, or if you do not clean the mare well during insemination, you potentially could be introducing pathogenic bacteria. And these bacteria set up shop, they cause inflammation, they cause endometritis, and that leads to long-term infertility in your mares. So you might have a really good fertile mare, you may have good quality semen, but because there is a break in hygiene, you essentially might be the reason that your mare is infertile. So even why breed with artificial insemination? You may have a good quality semen, you may have good quality stallion, uh, you may have a stallion that does its job really well. Why use artificial insemination at all? So again, it's a more efficient use uh, of semen from valuable stallions. You can use one single ejaculate to breed more mares per dose. You can introduce newer genetics in your herd. Uh, so more variable genetics means more uh, robust herd uh, genetically. You can have a safe alternative to life cover. Not everyone's comfortable handling stallions. Not all stallions are good to be handled. And plus, no one wants, usually people don't want stallions on their property because that can lead to additional issues. So you can ship semen or you can send your mares to be bred by AI and then still get the job done. It's a more hygienic way of breeding mares. Definitely stallion semen is not sterile. It contains a lot of bacteria. It contains a lot of debris. So essentially you're contaminating the track when you're doing a live cover. With uh, artificial insemination techniques, you have better extenders which have antibiotics. These antibiotics can lower the amount of bacteria inside that semen sample and lead to better pregnancy rates. You can control the quality of semen by evaluating it. You can filter out or increase the dose of semen, especially with poor quality samples. And that way you can increase your pregnancy rates much, much higher than your life covers. And then of course, uh, any extra semen can always be frozen. It can be used at a later date with frozen semen technology. That way you always have a backup plan or a reservoir in case the stallion dies or in case the stallion becomes infertile in future. So how do we monitor these mares? Our goal to breed these mares is to breed as close to ovulation as possible. And that way we have the sperm cells ready to fertilize the egg when it's ready. Hence, we, especially on our thoroughbred farms, we carry a lot of teasing. Most of our farms over here in the Waikato region in New Zealand have about 200 to 300 mares on each farm. We do not have time or the efforts to check every single mare every single day. Hence, we tease these mares. Uh, you need a good quality teaser and you can easily segregate mares that show estrus. You can get them uh, to your palpation barns and check them. Uh, using ultrasound mainly, which is very crucial, especially when you are dealing with AI technology. You may have uh, to identify, or you may have to identify these mares and inform the stallion station a few days beforehand, depending on the stallion station. And hence, we'd like to follow these mares in their cycle. That way we can call up the stallion station, order semen, or if you have a frozen semen sample in your clinic, you can then breed the mare at the appropriate time. The egg also has a limited lifespan inside the mare. So once the egg is released or the oocyte rather is released, it survives for only eight to 12 hours. And then also you need to also account those three or four hours that the sperm cells have to undergo capacitation in order to be ready for fertilization. So all of these numbers, all of these timelines play a big important part on when to breed this mare and get good pregnancy rates. Sometimes we try to hasten the process of ovulation by injecting these mares with certain hormones. You may have heard of deslorelin or HCG or Coriolan, and you can shorten the window of ovulation by several hours or even a couple of days and get this mare to ovulate at the right time so it coincides with your semen shipments. Uh, 
we do ovulation checks on these mares after being bred. So we need to confirm that this mare has indeed ovulated and formed a good CL. And then we also check mares for fluid because the semen or seminal plasma by itself induces certain reaction inside the mare. And we need to make sure that these mares are clean enough to carry an embryo and develop the embryo to term. So these are some images. Uh, ultrasound images as well as there's a big picture of the mare's ovary by itself and uh, as you can see the left side sided image has the ovary with multiple small growths on it these growths are follicles and there's a corresponding ultrasound image as you can see these follicles are mainly round uh, they have a black kind of a center area which contains fluid fluid appears black on ultrasound especially clear fluid appears black on ultrasound so on any given occasion in mares that are in heat, you will see these large or multiple follicles growing on a mare's ovary. We, besides ultrasounding, we also palpate these mare's ov mare ovaries to figure out which uh, follicle is large and how soft it is. Mares, uh, once they start getting these large follicles, these follicles start maturing. And once they mature to a certain stage, they start weakening their follicle wall on our end, we feel these follicles softening up. So that's why we try to palpate them uh, to feel for the softness. And that tells us how close these mares are to ovulation. On your next slide, you'll see several follicles. So there are two pictures of these follicles that are close to ovulation. We measure these follicles using electronic calipers, as you can see on the left side of the image. Again, you can see a big difference between your earlier picture where the follicles were nice and round and these follicles kind of have a misshapen wall. These are the follicles that are close to ovulation because their follicular wall has started weakening. On your extreme right, you can see a mare that has ovulated her follicle and now has a what is called as a CH uh, or corpus hemorrhagicum. This is essentially a cavity that's filled with blood after the follicle ovulates. And we use images like these to confirm that your mare has indeed ovulated. So when can we breed these mares or how much semen can we use to breed these mares? So semen longevity on the track depends on what kind or what quality of semen we're using. With fresh semen, it is very common to, for the semen to survive for several days. Uh, we've had, we've documented stallions that are known uh, to have that semen survive inside the mare for a good five to seven days. Uh, this, again, the longevity of the semen starts decreasing. So the chilled semen samples have a lifespan of maybe three or four days, uh, as opposed to frozen semen that has the least lifespan, which is just a few hours, which is about eight to 12 hours is what we imagine the semen survives inside the mare for. If you're AIing with fresh semen, you can AI this mare every other day. Uh, and the reason why I say every other day is you need to give one day off in between for the mare to clean her uterus out. If you breed the mare every single day, you're essentially overwhelming the system. And with the system being overwhelmed, these mares start developing endometritis and fluid. How much volume to put in? So we know that volumes that exceed beyond 60 ml may sometimes just leak back. So if you are putting in more than 60 ml inside a mare's tract, most of that semen might just flow out through the cervix and the semen is essentially just lost. So we try to limit our volumes to about 60, maybe up to 80 ml, depending, depending on the size of the mare. With these big draft mares, some mares might hold up to 80 ml, but otherwise anything beyond that is just gonna leak out. So using the entire ejaculate from a stallion that you have just collected might be impractical because you will have fluid that will just flow out. So you need to evaluate the semen. You need to put in the appropriate volume and the dose inside the semen. Otherwise you're just contaminating the reproductive tract of these mares. If you're using cool ship sample, uh, ideally we like to use these samples within 24 to 36 hours after collection. Otherwise their semen, um, the viability of the semen starts going down. We like to put in ideally about 500 million live cells inside the mare. And we try to ship double the amount of these cells, especially considering that half of these cells might be dead by the time they reach their destination. 
And then of course, because you're typically dealing with 50 to 60 ml volumes, you deposit the semen in the uterine body directly instead of deep on inseminations like we do in frozen semen. And then how often to breed? You can breed depending on the quality of the semen. You can breed every 12 or 24 hours, or even sometimes just once for mares that react very strongly to, these, uh, to the semen, especially problem mares. So these are just pictorial depictions of where we deposit semen. Uh, on your left-hand side, that's essentially a cartoon of the female reproductive tract. Uh, there's the square uh, in the center that shows the site of de deposition for your conventional like semen uh, methods or when you're using artificial insemination using chilled semen, that's where you deposit your semen as opposed to uh, you can identify that there's a uh, there's a site over here that's uh, almost to the tip of the uterine horn, and this is this coincides with the ovary that has that big follicle that's going to ovulate. So when we do frozen semen inseminations, because the volumes are really small or the doses might be really, really small, we like to uh, place our pipette all the way up to the tip of this uterine horn and deposit semen so that the semen has less distance to travel and can reach the ovary really, really quickly. And then the center image is just your AI pipette. And you can see the reason why they're bent it is they're, they're trying to kind of depict how flexible this pipette is. And you can essentially bend the pipette going in and it kind of bends along the curvature of the uterus and you can deposit it all the way up the tip of the horn. On your right-hand side, uh, you have endoscopic images of the tip of that horn. So this tiny bubble in the center of this image is the junction between the uterus and the oviduct. It is governed by this big uh, papilla. It's called as the uterotubal papilla. And sometimes with certain frozen semen samples, you can deposit, you can go in with an endoscope and you can deposit the semen directly on this oviductal papilla. We've had samples that have poor quality and low volume. And especially in samples like those, you can deposit, you can pass an endoscope all the way inside the mare's uterus, all the way up to the tip of that oviductal papilla, and then uh, deposit semen directly on it. And that sometimes helps to increase mm. your pregnancy rates. So uh, let's talk a bit about embryo transfer technology. Uh, there are several advantages of carrying an embryo transfer inside a mare. For example, you can keep on getting foals from these performance or show horses without a break in their career. Um, most of these, especially these jumpers or dressage horses, they kind of peak in their mid kind of uh, age or when they're about eight or 10 years old. You do not necessarily want these mares to spend another year carrying a foal to term. So you can keep flushing and getting embryos out of these horses and just let them follow their or pursue their career. You can get multiple folds from the same mare per year. Again, that is dictated largely by um, the breed registry. So you need to make sure that your breed registry allows X number of folds per year. And then you stick to that in order to register those folds. Uh, of course, mares having reproductive or infertility issues will benefit from embryo transfer, as well as folds, uh, mares having non-reproductive issues. Some mares have musculoskeletal issues, they have a weak body wall, they may have pelvic issues or fractures, or they may have bad hocks that may uh, get them to be difficult mares to carry pregnancies to term. And in those cases, you can benefit from embryo transfer and then prevent this mare from having issues during pregnancy. Again, embryo transfer is like the first step towards development of newer technologies like ICSI, for example, or nuclear transfer. And uh, that kind of creates a whole uh, new area of development that currently is underway in equine reproductive science. So these are, in brief, the steps that uh, essentially are carried out for an embryo transfer inside a mare. We identify the appropriate donor and the recipient. Sometimes you have more than one recipient per donor, and that just helps as a backup in case that one single recipient doesn't line up with the donor or synchronize her cycle with the donor. Our next step is to synchronize the cycle, the reproductive cycle of this donor and the recipient. And we can sometimes use certain hormones 
in order to do that. Or sometimes the easiest way is essentially is to house these mares together and sometimes they sync their cycles together just by a smell of hormones from each other. We like to breed the, the donor, of course, at the appropriate time, like we discussed before, uh, breeding at the right time, as close to ovulation as possible. Uh, all of those are essential to get good pregnancy rates. We do a good post breeding management on these mares so that they are not developing any fluid. They don't have any endometritis or inflammation inside their uterus. And then approximately a week after we flush these mares, about seven or eight days, depending on what you want to do with the embryo. You can flush these mares after ovulation with the, the day of ovulation being day zero, right? Once we flush the mare, we search the embryo inside that petri dish, and the picture on your the bottom of your screen shows this is essentially just a drop. It's been magnified several hundred times, and you can see a day eight embryo inside that one single drop inside a petri dish. So we try to search for these embryos. We grade the embryos based on the health of the embryo, grade one being a good quality uh, pristine embryo and a grade four being a poor quality embryo. Poor quality embryos, of course, have lower pregnancy rates inside recipients. And then once we grade and wash these embryos, we transfer them directly inside the recipient. Now, if your recipient has not lined up with the donor, you have an alternate alternative of freezing the embryo for a longer term so that you can transfer it when you have a recipient available or when the donor becomes ready to carry her pregnancy to term. Okay. Again, this is just a quick diagram of the embryo flush procedure. For those who don't know, we have this embryo bag, like we have the flush bag that's connected to a Y-piece tubing. This one, uh, one way of tubing goes inside, is attached to a catheter that goes inside the mare. So we open the valve on this tubing, we push the fluid inside. Once the fluid kind of gets to a certain point, we shut the valve, we open the valve that drains the fluid out. And this fluid essentially goes through a filter down here. And this filter drains the excessive fluid and traps the embryo. And essentially it's the filter that we are checking after we perform this procedure. And once we have that filter, we essentially take it to the um, take it to the lab. We transfer the contents of that filter inside a petri dish, and then we look for the embryo inside uh, underneath a microscope. So sometimes uh, day eight or day nine embryos are quite big. Uh, as a, uh, you can see in this image, you can easily identify an embryo lying inside the petri dish. Sometimes you're not so lucky; you get mares with a lot of debris inside this uterus, but Patience and uh, a little bit of luck sometimes goes a long way in identifying embryos. So you need to keep on plugging on. And then despite all this debris, you can make out an embryo right here in the center. There's an embryo despite having this dirty flush from a mare. So we've had several mares that have had dirty flushes. So that's not the end of the world. You just sometimes have to be patient and just keep on searching and hopefully in most occasions you find an embryo. Another exciting thing is if you do not have a mare to transfer this embryo to, nowadays we have these ready to use vitrification kits or equine vit kits. And you can use these kits inside a clinic, sometimes even in the field to transfer, uh, to freeze the embryo and store it for a long time storage. So, when you freeze an embryo, think about it this way. You have this embryo that is filled with fluid, right? If you freeze water, the water expands and forms ice. So this embryo, if it gets frozen, expands, and when it expands, it breaks the embryo and it destroys the embryo. So what we do when we freeze embryos is we gradually dehydrate the embryo by putting it into special solutions. We drain the fluid out, as you can see from this picture, this entire embryo is collapsed. So we have drained the fluid out of this embryo. Now we replace this fluid with certain special fluids. They are called as cryoprotectants because they protect the embryo during the freezing process. And you rehydrate the embryo with these cryoprotectants. You freeze the embryo into a glass-like state. Vitrification literally means converting to a glass-like state. So we freeze the embryo with rapid freezing and we store it. Now, when it's ready to be used, we warm the embryo 
we rehydrate the embryo with your regular fluids and then we transfer it. So you can see from this state, it has rehydrated and grown back to its original size, right? The advantages to vitrification are you get these kits ready-made from several suppliers. So it's very easy to get the chemicals required for it. Uh, the technique is very easy with a little bit of practice and a little bit of training. Most veterinarians will be able to do this technique in a clinic or even on your farm. Uh, it's cheap and it has relatively good pregnancy rates after the transfer, as long as your recipient is a good healthy recipient, okay? So uh, our last topic is infertility management in maize. And I thought I'll briefly touch base on it. Again, like I said, infertility is a really vast topic, but I'll try to go through basics of it and what we have to offer you guys in order to get good pregnancy rates. The so infertility uh, essentially means inability to conceive or even carry or maintain a pregnancy up to term. It could be because of various factors. You can kind of broadly divide these factors into two major ones. You have the internal environment that's inside the mare. Uh, so you can have endometritis. Endometritis essentially means inflammation of the uterus. Uh, that uh, It can be because of poor egg quality. Uh, older mares usually have older, like older eggs or poor, poor eggs that lead to less fertility. Uh, you can have a poor uterine score. Uteruses in older men start becoming older. They have less uterine glands to support the pregnancy. And in those cases, you can have a man that keeps on losing that embryo, despite having a good quality embryo. You can have definitely have genetic causes that can lead to infertility issues like uh, karyotypes or, uh, or um, intersex conditions in men that can cause them to be infertile or you can have certain types of tumors on the ovary or elsewhere in the body that can prevent these mares from conceiving. Of course, you have the external factors, that is poor conformation, uh, mares with sunken vulva, mares with tilted pelvis, mares that have urine pooling issues inside their uteruses, mares that have any form of systemic illness, uh, Cushing's disease, laminitis, uh, they might have certain infections that can cause fever, and that can make them lose these pregnancies. Of course, a lot of these internal environmental issues are very common in old mares, because just like uh, the, the older you get, the less efficient you are reproductively. And then before you blame the mare, to be honest, always, always rule out stallion and sperm issues. And I put that in, in I have seen half of my cases I would probably want, won't say half, but 20, 25% of my cases are as a result of poor management or poor quality semen. So before you start treating your mares, before you start putting antibiotics or before you start flushing mares out, you need to rule out the stallion related issues or semen related issues. Again, like I said before, good hygiene, good management on part of the stallion and the mare go a really long way in ensuring good pregnancy rates and embryo recovery rates. So most common form of infertility or most common cause of infertility is endometritis or inflammation of the uterus. And there are two main reasons why males can get endometritis. One is the failure of physical barriers. There are three physical barriers inside the male that prevent a male from getting infection. The first one being the vulva, that if you have a good uh, conformation, external conformation of the vulva, it prevents any fecal contamination. It prevents air being sucked in inside. The next being the vestibule. Vestibule is the junction between the vulva and the vaginal canal. And if you have a, uh, some, you've heard the term wind suckers. And in those cases, these mares essentially have a break in the vulva and the vestibule. And these mares keep on sucking air that irritates the tract that causes fecal contamination. And then the last barrier, of course, is the cervix. If you have a poor quality cervix, if you have cervical tears, if you have any damage to the cervix that has happened during foalings, that can cause these mares to essentially uh, you know, break down that barrier and be prone to infections. And then you have a second major cause known as persistent mating-induced endometritis, or PMI. And like, like I said before, mares react to semen irrespective of what quality of semen you're using. Every mare reacts to semen. The trick is, however, 
if the mayor is able to get rid of all this infection on her own or not, right? So endometritis, of course, leads to inflammation. It releases certain chemicals. A lot of these mares essentially start off being pregnant, but because of the, the release of these chemicals, it creates an unhealthy environment. It kills the embryo, and then that leads to infertility. So this is a very busy slide, but essentially the bottom line of all this, these arrows means that you have these resistant mares. You have mares that are able to mount a proper immune response to the semen, to bacteria that are introduced inside the mare at the time of insemination. They can contract their uterus really well, and then they can clean the uterus out, or it's known as uterine clearance. And then on the flip side, you have these at-risk mares or problem mares that do not mount a proper immune response. They are not able to contract the uterus. This leads to fluid accumulation. And then these mares have a defect in cleaning their uterus out. So it is these mares, the susceptible mares or the problem mares that are more prone for endometritis and eventual infertility issues. So we need to identify these mares much earlier in their cycle or sometimes even immediately after breeding and then treat these mares well beforehand so that these mares can clean their uterus out and still maintain a pregnancy. So these are two pictures of uh, the left side showing a mare with a normal conformation. You can see how straight the vulva is followed by the, the rectum, which is in line with the vulva, as opposed to the picture on the right, where you have a poor conformation, you have a vulva that's sunk uh, because the anus is sunk forward. This kind of pulls the vulva over the pelvic brim. It leads to a break in the uh, barriers. It leads to fecal contamination. And then this mare will suck air inside. They'll, she'll accumulate fluid and she'll be more prone to endometritis. So there are certain reasons why these mares can have a delayed uterine clearance. Of course, age is a major factor. With older age, we have loss of muscle mass, uh, especially mares more than 12 years of age can be susceptible to these delayed uterine clearances. If you have a mare that has carried many, many folds to term, these mares usually have a large, heavy uterus that kind of hangs over the pelvic brim and then with gravity it just holds more fluid and it's not able to contract well and it's not able to clean that uterus out really well. You have conformational defects like a sunk vulva, you can have issues internally like a tilted pelvis or a cervical tear that can all lead to anatomic issues which can lead to mass accumulating fluid inside their uterus. And then in more severe cases with you know with chronic infertility, you can literally have fibrosis that can sit inside the uterus. This fibrosis blocks uterine glands. It leads to altered lymphatic drainage. And then now you have a mare with a chronic infertility issue that just can't maintain pregnancy or may not even get pregnant. So bacteria are one of the main the reasons why mares get endometritis. Uh, so infectious endometritis is a leading cause of infertility. There are several species of bacteria that we have identified in mares. One of the most common ones being strep equi, zoo epidemicus, or we call them as briefly as strep zoo. And then of course you have your stallions that can transmit infections to mares. Uh, you can have pseudomonas, Klebsiella and Taylorella. These are the STIs or sexually transmitted infections in mares, primarily coming from stallions. So you need to clean your stallions. You need to sometimes swab your stallions. You need to culture these swabs to make sure that your stallion is free, especially if you're using uh, AV or artificial vaginas between stallions. You need to ensure that your stallion is clean and is not transmitting bacteria from every to every mare that he's breeding. Now, with new advances in understanding endometritis or even new advances in microbiology, we know that some of these bacteria actually produce this thick film called as a biofilm. And uh, this has been a very exciting area of research in the last about five or seven years. Uh, reason behind being these biofilms essentially protect bacteria from our treatments. So they form a thick covering. These bacteria are smart enough to hide underneath these biofilms. And when you treat the mare with, bacteria, with antibiotics, these antibiotics just don't penetrate these biofilms, and then these bacteria keep on persisting 
and then they cause inflammation and infertility. There are several communities of bacteria that sometimes share uh, these biofilms. So you may have a particular bacteria that don't even produce biofilms that hide under these biofilms and further complicate your treatment protocols. So how do we approach diagnosis of infertility in these mares? We, of course, like to get a thorough history from you guys. So when you bring a mare in, a problem mare in the clinic, make sure that you share the complete reproductive history, however irrelevant that you might think it might be. It's always difficult. It's always easy to get more facts and then try and figure out if these facts fit the picture. So we like to get a really thorough history from you guys, uh, including a non-reproductive health history if the mayor has had issues uh, other than reproduction in the past. We would like to know more about it. Again, also rule out stallion and semen factors, uh, like I mentioned before. And then once we have this history, we like to ultrasound your mares. We like to look at the track. We like to see if these mares actually have two good ovaries that are active. They are growing follicles. Sometimes we'll do a swab or a cytology for bacterial cultures, especially if we suspect uh, bacterial endometritis. And then we send these to the lab. They'll grow these bacteria. They'll tell us which antibiotics to use appropriately. And then we'll try and use those antibiotics intrauterine, or sometimes we even give them systemically uh, via injections or oral paste, and that sometimes helps to treat bacterial endometritis. Uh, in, term, in, in cases of certain tumors or like infertility uh, intersex conditions like this picture over here, this may have actually had testes and ovaries growing in the same tissue. And obviously, this mare was never going to get pregnant, but we send uh, blood samples from these mares to various labs for karyotyping. Uh, just to rule out uh, why this mare might not be getting pregnant. Uh, we sometimes, if everything else fails, we do uterine biopsies, and then these biopsies tell, tell us the health or reveal us the health of the uterus. And then lastly, but not last, uh, least, we do genetic testing or karyotyping. So ultrasonography tells us how this mare's uterus reacts to semen or even before breeding, sometimes these mares have an excessive edema inside their uterus or fluid accumulation inside their uterus. And both, both of these are indicative of a highly reactive uterus, which leads to a suspicion of inflammation and endometritis. Uh, uterine cultures and cytology, we have these double guarded swabs that you can safely put inside the mare's uterus and collect the sample in a sterile manner. And then there are these three different swabs we use, the last one being almost like a bristle-like brush that gives us a good uh, cytology, or we like to look at the cells of the uterus. Uh, in the top picture over here, you can see how a normal uterine cytology looks. All of these uh, purple cells are uterine cells. This is a healthy, normal uterus followed by endometritis, which essentially you can see all of these blue cells. These are all neutrophils or white blood cells. Uh, they out, outnumber the uterine cells uh, far, far more. And then this is like an acute or a very um, uh, active endometritis going on. In your right-hand picture over here, you can see yeast cells. Some, back, some uh, mares will get fungal or yeast endometritis. And uh, these are more difficult mares to treat rather than bacterial ones. Uh, sometimes we do see bacteria that have been swallowed by these white blood cells. Uh, these are inflammatory cells that are actually engulfing the bacteria and destroying them. And then we send all these, all these samples to our labs, which grow uh, these cells on, or we grow these cytologies on uh, these culture plates. You can have these different bacteria growing in different media. And then these labs are able to tell us which antibiotics to use in these mares. With your uterine biopsies, as, it's, uh, as invasive as it sounds, the uterine biopsy is relatively non-invasive. It's a way quick procedure, but it tells us a wealth of information. So on your uh, left-hand side, you can actually see all you need to figure out is the score over here. So you can have a score of one, which essentially is a normal uterus. And these males have an 80 to 90% chance of carrying a live fold to term. And then the grade essentially keeps on increasing as the health deteriorates. And then you have the grade three uterus, which is probably the worst kind of a uterine score. And these males have a less than 10% chance of 
carrying a full to term. When you have chronically infertile mares, it is very useful to do these uterine biopsies because you might be spending a lot of money and time and effort in trying to get these mares to carry a pregnancy, whereas these mares might be ideal candidates for embryo transfer, right? So our treatment options. So a healthy baby, of course, needs a clean and healthy environment. So our goal is to clean that uterus out. Our goal is to reduce the inflammation inside their uterus. So we start off by correcting any defects. If you have a sunk vulva, we'll do a catholic surgery. If you have a mare with urine pooling, we'll do urethral extensions on these mares. We'll try to correct these anatomic defects and try and keep the uterus from getting infected. That would be our first stage. Uh, this is followed by if this mare has a bacterial infection, we try to use appropriate antibiotics inside the uterus or in the mare uh, in order to treat these bacterial infections. We sometimes flush these mares out with saline, sterile saline solutions. It's also called as uterine lavage. And then we give them oxytocin in order to help them contract their uterus and clean out all this fluid. We like to identify these risk, at-risk mares or problem mares early in their cycle so that we can identify them early enough to start our treatment early enough before it becomes into a, you know, develops into a full-blown infection. And then, of course, if we have a mare that's chronically infertile, we start talking or we start the dialogue of embryo transfer technology with the clients. Sometimes these mares need hormones like progesterone or regimate in order to support the pregnancies. So the treatment options are variable. It all depends on what the main problem is. And the sooner we identify the problem, the more appropriate treatment we can start instituting early enough, right? So with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you so much for listening to it. And uh, I will be happy to take any questions if you have any. Feel free to unmute and ask a question, or you can put it in the chat as well, and we will monitor that and share those questions. Are you watching the ICD as well? Yeah. No, this is Swan Ed. I was talking on here. Oh, there's Lana. Dr. Lana Delaney is with us as well, so she can answer some questions too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I kind of thought. We just did, we did just truly just rock her. Okay. See, you solved all their problems. <laughs> I do sometimes. Did anyone have thoughts about their own specific mares or thoughts or questions about what you heard? Uh, Swan and speak about. Oh, we've got mm -hmm. one here. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> Okay, so Jenny says, is there anything I can give my mare to calm her down during breeding? She is very stressed when trailering. You wanna take that, Lana? Well, that's a good question. And, and truly, <laughs> yeah, he's probably laughing at me. Um, this mare, like when she comes, she seems okay, but she is soaking wet when she comes off the trailer. She takes at least a day or two to relax. And then I just worry, right? That she gets too wound up. Even when we bring a friend with her, that doesn't seem to help her. So we try to keep her in the same spot. Um, but she just wants to pool a bit of fluid. She just needs to relax. I'm, you know, we can always use chill, things like that, extra magnesium. I'm not a big drug person on these mares that we're trying to breed. So I don't like to do things like that. But yeah, that's a very good question because I think that's part of her issue. It's a more behavioral issue. Is that right? It, it truly is. And I'm sure Yanni would say the same thing too. She just gets so wound up that it's hard. And, you know, she'll lose 50, 50 pounds in a week at the clinic. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe at the time of breeding, we usually sit there with them. So, I mean, you can always yeah. use astromazine or yeah. xylazine. But and the sedation, she's actually good, like to ultrasound her and to... Uh, to breed her stuff, she's super good. It's truly once you take her out of the barn and put her in the corral. So I guess, I guess time and patience as mm -hmm. they get the mayor used to the environment, get get her in the clinic a few days earlier, get her used to her pasture mates and her friends, and then calm her down. 
But yeah. I, I've, I've heard about use of magnesium as well. And to, to date, I have not seen anything that says it should not be used. Or, yeah, uh, yeah so I, I guess that's an, that's, that's an option for these mares. Um, in my opinion, it helps in certain mares. It helps really well in certain mares. And we have some thoroughbred mares over here in New Zealand that just blow it off. I'm like, eh, I'm just going to do what I want to do. Okay, and so Rory says, when will you be starting at Delaney's? <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> soon as soon as we can get government um, paperwork through, that seems to be our Alberta problem. Yes, we've had a few holdups there. So uh, when we know, we'll be sure to let everybody know, but uh, we hope relatively soon. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to it, really. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're looking forward to having you here. It'll be great. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so Nancy says, so if I am breeding a mare every second year, is 12 years of age still an age of reduced fertility? So uh, to be honest, the other day I, I was reading a news about a 67-year-old woman that delivered twins. Uh, and the reason I say that, the reason I say that is we, we try to we try to assume that 12 years is like a middle age or them moving on to an older age kind of deal. But uh, we if if you have a mare that's getting a break every other year, yes, she's getting older by a year. As long as she's producing foals, we in a thoroughbred business, especially because mares have to carry their own foals. We have 20, 22 year old mares that carry foods to term, as long as they're taken care of well, as long as uh, any, any possible problems are identified well in advance, uh, most mares are quite efficient uh, reproductive machines. I'm sorry to hear, we use that term. It's a, it's a way thoroughbred term, but um, yeah, they, they are very, very efficient reproductive machines. So as long as they're healthy, as long as you identify any possible issues, should be okay. Super. So Aaron asks, for older mares, I have heard that late season breeding works better. Is this the case? Uh, not really. Uh, I, I mean, I don't see any scientific basis for it. A mare is a mare is a mare. I mean, she's going to cycle as long as you breed her at the right time and as long as you carry good pre and post breeding management. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're breeding early or late in the season. We, we do have issues with some mares. I wouldn't say necessarily older mares, but we do have issues with certain mares that early in the season, because they are just coming off from this long period of non-cyclicity. So sometimes some mares, especially older mares, require some time to clean their uteruses out going through several heat cycles. So during a particular heat cycle, the defense mechanisms of that uterus are really ramped up. So when a mare is in heat, her uterus is fully primed to get rid of any bacteria or any inflammation. So some of these mares actually require more heat cycles to actually go through and you know get to a stage where they now they they have a clean uterus and they can carry that pregnancy to term. And maybe that's where that uh, term came from. Is like hey, you breed them later in the year and then they get pregnant, but I mean, peak season, you breed any mare, she should be, as long as you carry a good pre and post breeding management, doesn't matter. We, in fact, we, we try to get our mares, I mean, in the thoroughbred business, we try to get our mares pregnant as early as possible, right? Because uh, our season is way short. We, uh, with thoroughbreds, especially in the Northern hemisphere, your thoroughbred foals have a birth date of Jan 1, irrespective of when they are born. So we, not, we have to get these mares pregnant at the earliest by May. And the peak breeding season for mares in the Northern Hemisphere is June. So we are essentially trying to get these mares pregnant even earlier. And some of these mares might even be 20 years old. So we still get, get that job done. So yeah, I mean, I, uh, uh, that probably is the only reason I would imagine why some of these mares get pregnant towards the end of the year or towards the end of the season is they, they require those heat cycles to just keep cleaning themselves out. Great. 
Um, Darla is asking, for a maiden mare who has had placentitis, what are the chances of a second breeding being normal? Uh, quite, quite good, actually. Uh, as long as that placentitis is not caused due to any anatomic issues. So if you have a mare that has cervical defects, for example, say there's a cervical tear or a cervical fibrosis, uh, this cervix, this un incompetent cervix will still be a source of infection for her future pregnancies, right? So as long as you don't have any permanent anatomical defects, uh, most mares should be just fine, and they, they should not be at any higher risk of carrying uh, a pr pregnancy to term or at higher risk of developing placentitis. But if you do have a mare with anatomic defects, that needs to be addressed first before breeding the mare. Otherwise, like mare with a cervical tear will always be at risk of developing placentitis for that matter. Uh, Tracy, um, do you like to keep a problem mare at the clinic until they have caught? And if so, how long do you want them to stay? I, 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 I didn't hear the first part of the question. Can uh, you repeat so, that question again, Mia? Sure. She said, do you like to keep problem mares at the clinic until they have caught? And if so, how long do you want them to stay? Until they have what? caught so until they're in full pregnant oh got it um uh i i get yeah i would like to see a pregnancy i mean for example we do have problem mares that sometimes stay at the clinic not at the clinic over here but we do like to follow them at least till 45 up to 60 days until we see a good heartbeat until we see the transition of the embryo to a fetal stage and uh whether to keep them in a clinic is required or not is a, I, I don't think they need to be staying in the clinic for uh, for that period of time. You could definitely bring them in more often to get them checked at every 10 days or so is what I would recommend, uh, at least until they reach that 60, 65 day mark. Uh, that's when we like to kind of assume that they're entering the safe period after 60, 65 days. But whether they need to consistently stay in the clinic up till that time, because we are not gonna literally palpate that mare every single day unless Lana wants to. But uh, but again, the point being, as long as they have been taken care of, if you have good facilities in your place, if you are taking good care of your mare, you can just bring them in periodically at the prescribed times or dates and then have them checked. These mares definitely need to be checked more often than your regular mares do, but as long as those checks are done, we should be fine. Okay, and the next question from Scotia Horses is, what protocol would you do for an older mare that cultures clean, bred several times AI, so this good semen, flushed and oxytocin protocol after breeding and comes up open, but mare breeds and carries foals live cover after two years trying AI. And the reason she's asking this is that she would like to breed AI. So again, depending on the age of the mare, I would like to rule out, again, I'm saying rule out because I'm not sure whether that's a problem or not. I would definitely like to rule out uh, biofilms. I would definitely like to rule out any uh, mucus plugs inside the uterus. I would definitely like to rule out blocked oviducts in some of these older mares. So uh, we, we like to sometimes uh, treat these mares with uh, acetylcysteine, or sometimes we even treat them with uh, prostaglandins, either uh, injected on their oviducts through a laparoscope, or even put inside the uterus uh, with the deep horn insemination technique. And then we try to unblock their oviducts. Uh, some of these mares do have, if they have been um, open for a long, long time. They sometimes get blocked oviducts because of all that cellular debris from each population. And uh, we like to sometimes just rule that out by um, cleaning those oviducts or cleaning the uterus out and then trying. Uh, I have had a good success with acetylcysteine personally. 
uh, acetylcysteine is like a mucolytic agent and you essentially clean the uterus out, you clean all the uterine plugs out, that helps the semen travel faster or more efficiently inside the uterus. And uh, that sometimes does the trick. Again, um, would like to investigate more, to be honest, than actually just saying that, hey, these treatments are gonna work for sure. Uh, with processed semen, with AI, uh, if you're especially using frozen semen, with frozen semen, you have a lesser dose. You also have less robust cells uh, as opposed to live uh, cover of fresh semen. And then there's a strong suspicion of some issues with semen transport. So we talked about how the semen moves, how the sperm cells move from the uterus up to the oviduct. There definitely is an issue with some frozen samples of the sperm cells being able to travel inside certain mares from that uterus up to the oviducts. So we like to rule those things out. Again, I'm not saying that is your mares problem, but I would like to rule those things out before we try breeding her with AI. Yes, I guess that's what I would. Uh, any thoughts of that, Lana? I agree. Okay. Okay, so Aaron asks, is it best to flush these older mares then to clean the uterus for pregnancy? I like to flush a lot of my old mares, to be honest, uh, just as a, uh, uh, I find it a cheaper alternative than coming up with an open mare after following her the entire cycle and then going through that entire process again and spending more of the client money. I would rather uh, clean that mare out after breeding with a liter or two liters of saline and put her on oxytocin. Uh, and that's, that's, I guess that's what I was trying to kind of stress on during that presentation is identifying these at-risk mares. They don't necessarily have to be problem mares, but they are at-risk mares, meaning they have, they're older mares, they have this long, big pendulous uterus that hangs below the pelvic brim and uh, they potentially could be um, harboring fluid or they potentially could have issues with uterine clearance. So when I'm spending a whole bunch of my time and efforts and the client's money in monitoring these mares for frozen semen or monitoring these mares for chilled semen, I do like to go that extra mile and essentially flush that mare out uh, if I can. And that way I'm covering all my bases and uh, ensuring that I'm giving the best possible chance for that mare to get pregnant. And that way I'm ruling that one thing out in case the mare doesn't get pregnant in the first place. Okay, um, CK Ku asks, do you to prefer to breed on full heat or to short cycle the mare? There are three rules of thumb for breeding mares on full heat. Again, they don't necessarily apply to every single mare, but the three rules of thumb are, one is the mare needs to be ideally less than 12 years of age, ideally. Again, there are some, there, there are some maiden mares that might be older, that may have a tight, nice tight uterus uh, that doesn't hang below the pelvic brain necessarily. These mares might still be a good candidate for full heat breeding, but, um, that's the rule number one. The rule number two is they should not have issues during folding. Uh, so no distortions, no uh, problems during folding, nice clean folding. And then the third rule of thumb is no history of retained placentas. So as long as those three rules are followed, uh, a lot of males are good candidates for full heat breeding. But if you have issues with during folding or post folding issues, I would not necessarily breed these mares in COVID. I just short cycle them and bring them back. Older mares, 15, 16 year old mares, we try to skip them. Uh, again, even in our thoroughbred industry, with the pressures on us to actually get these mares in full as soon as possible, we try to short cycle mares ideally about 15 years of age and then bring them back because we, we find our pregnancy rates to be lower uh, about this age. So Terry Lynn asks, if breeding a performance mare who is carrying her own, is it safe to continue competing with her? And if so, for how long? So the mare is used to being competed on and is well-conditioned. 
And to add to that, once the foal is on the ground, how long would you wait to start reconditioning after birth? I, you can chip in anytime, Lana. Uh, I'm just gonna throw my thoughts out over here, is uh, we have performance mares over here that I breed and they essentially uh, still do their work until about four or five months of age easily uh, without any issues. Some of them might even go up to six months. Uh, so mid, mid pregnancy roughly. Uh, post foaling, uh, I would wait for a couple of months um, make sure that the foal is growing well, make sure everything is well, make sure the mare uh, has started putting back some of her weight, because most mares sometimes might lose condition, especially if they're nursing a foal uh, that's kind of growing really rapidly. So I would give them a couple of months off before you can start putting some condition on or putting them back into training. Uh, over here, we wean our foals at around six to eight weeks of age. Um, and then people essentially, after weaning, start training their mares back again. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, is there something different that you guys do over there, Leah? Yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable for the sport mares I know. Lana, do you have anything to add? Lana's left. Yep, she might not be with us anymore. Uh, Okay, so we'll move on to Joyce. She says, I have a mare who had a massive uterine cyst removed last spring. Is it reasonable to assume that her hormone levels have returned to normal going into the 2021 breeding season? <clears throat> so should I have her hormone levels tested? Note that I plan to have Delaney's breed with warm blood frozen semen. Um, she qualifies that as expensive and so-so quality. So... If it was truly a uterine cyst, there should be no issues with her hormones because uterine cysts by themselves are not hormonally productive. So, I mean, uterine cysts by themselves don't produce any hormones. The reason why mares have uterine cysts um, is because they have blocked lymphatics inside. So the lymphatics, because of old age, because of any uterine fibrosis get blocked, they cannot drain their lymphatic fluid out. And that's the reason why mares get uterine cysts. Um, this mare had a the, GTC, though, oh, the size of a football. Oh, GCD, okay, all right. Okay. GTC, all right. yeah, it, was, it truly was the size of a football. Okay, no, no, I, because I heard uterine cysts, uh, I said uterine cysts yeah. by themselves are not hormonally active, but yes, if you have a GCT, then you, yes, ideally, this mare's literally running on one single engine, right? You, you got, if you remove her, another ovary you might want to test not you might want to follow uh, this mare during early pregnancy especially and make sure that she's producing enough progesterone sometimes these mares might require additional progesterone especially around that 30 35 day mark because around that period both of these mares ovaries in normal mares produce progesterone and since this girl is running on a single engine you might want to make sure that she's producing enough progesterone on her own. Uh, to be on the safe side, sometimes people like to put them on regimate until about 120 days of their gestation, but it would be a good idea to test her uh, periodically, at, at least in the early pregnancy, to make sure she's producing enough progesterone on her own. You don't have to necessarily test her before breeding her because as long as the other ovary is active, as long as she's producing a follicle and ovulating, she should be fine. But once she's bred, make sure that she's producing enough progesterone. Perfect. Uh, Darla asked one more question. Do you have your own recent mares? If so, what is your protocol at the end of weaning? So I think I can probably answer that a little bit. We do have our own herd of recipient mares. Um, once that mare is confirmed in foal at 14 or pregnant at 14 days, we lease her to you. And then once she weans the foal, you get a portion of that lease price back when you return her after the weaning. Uh, let me know if that answers your question. Do you have anything to add there, Swanand? Do you have a protocol at the end of weaning? For any of the recips for us, they just come back and we intake no. them again. And yep, that's exactly what we do. Yep. Super. And 
Terry Lynn, Joyce, Aaron, Lana, or they all say thank you. And that seems to be the end of our questions. Great. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all of you uh, for being here today. And it was a great, I hope, really hope to meet you guys way soon in the future. And hopefully all this uh, paperwork goes through really well. Yes, we all agree and we look forward to meeting you. Thank you so much for yeah. all of your Thanks. help and your knowledge and wealth of experience yeah. there. And thank you to everyone that joined. Um, if you have any further questions, feel free to email us at uh, repro at delaneyvetservices.com and we will do our best to answer any lingering questions. So we'll end that and thank you to everybody. And Thanks. Thank you, Swana. Thanks, Leah. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. See you, thank you. Yeah, see you, Lana. I will return your email. I just saw your emails. I'll return those answers back. I'll, I'll answer them. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. See you guys. Bye-bye.